lawyer in Minnesota, had run some campaigns, but I never even thought of running for office. And our daughter was born, and she was really sick, and she couldn't even swallow. They thought she had a tumor. They didn't know what was wrong. She was up all night with these tests. She was in intensive care. And back then, they had one of those rules that a new mom could only stay in the hospital for 24 hours. Even when she'd been up all night, didn't know if her baby was going to live and die. And I remember my husband wheeling me out of the hospital, and I looked up at him, and I go, this wouldn't happen to the wife of the head of the insurance company. <laughs> well, that was what the laws were back then. And I was a young new mom with a sick baby, and I just thought, I'm not going to let this happen to anyone else. And I started calling my legislators, and I ended up going in and testifying before the legislature, and we passed one of the first laws in the country guaranteeing new moms and their babies a 48-hour hospital stay. My lesson did not end then, because then we had the conference committee with the legislators. I'd never heard of such a thing. And I realized they were trying, no one could say they were against the bill, but there were people trying to delay it so it wouldn't start for a year, so it wouldn't start for two years. So I decided I would bring six of my pregnant friends to the conference committee. So they outnumber the lobbyists two to one. And when the legislators said, well, when should this bill take effect? All the pregnant moms raised their hand and said, now. And that's exactly what happened. That's what happened. And that is when I got hooked on politics. Really the politics of governing, the politics of getting things done, not the politics of just standing alone in a room giving a speech on green eggs and ham at three in the morning when no one's listening. <laughs> so I think you all know what it's like to get things done. You have role models, political leaders that know how to get things done. And you know how to win elections. Uh, you know how to win elections in the corners of this state. And you know how to win elections against some pretty tough odds. Uh, it was you guys who sent Harry Reid back to the Senate in 2010. And you did it. You did it even though you were outspent nearly two to one by outside groups. Two to one by outside groups. And you did it. Uh, when the polls and the pundits said that Obama could never win in this state, when Karl Rove said no way is he going to win in Nevada, you showed that anything and everything was possible. That a guy named Barack Obama could win in this state. That's what you did. Now, one of my favorite stories from the 2012 election was really a national story where the Republicans, as you recall, had that hearing with all men, remember that, in the House of Representatives on contraceptives. Uh, and I remember Barbara Mikulski with our gathering, our women in the Senate, and we stood and she stood on top of a couch because she's so short, and she looked at all of us, she said, square your shoulders, suit up, put your lipstick on, and get ready for a revolution! <laughs> And so anyway, but we fought back. We fought back. We had candidates out there that were talking about legitimate rape. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Well, you know how we fought back? Yeah. We won those elections, and we now have a record number of 20 women in the United States Senate. Yeah. We fought back. 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 We were able then to pass the strong version of the Violence Against Women Act that yes. protects LGBT population, that protected our women on tribal reservation. We yes. fought back. Yes. And I can tell you it was the women of the Senate then who came together during that shutdown. And by the way, I had, there have been some low moments this year, and one of my funnier was with Harry, New Year's Eve, fiscal cliff vote, right? We're going until 3 in the morning, and there I look, and I look at midnight, and I'm standing with Harry Reid's every girl's dream, okay? <laughs> but I'm like, okay, this is interesting for my New Year's Eve. But then I go into the shutdown, and we're losing billions of dollars because of these Tea Party extremists that are taking things on. Well, there was a group that came together with Harry's blessing. Half of them were women. Half of them were women. Because we were able to bridge that gap, come up with some ideas, present them, and guess what? We then got a budget. And thanks to Patty Murray negotiating over with the Republicans in the House and Barbara Mikulski, we finally have a budget. So we are careening from fiscal crisis to fiscal crisis, and states like Nevada can truly build their tourism industry, their energy economy, and that's what we should be doing in Washington. Oh, wow. yeah. I think you know we 
have some challenges, and it's really smartly the topic of your convention, the theme of what you're talking about uh, today. Uh, in the Senate, I chair the Joint Economic Committee, and this year we put together a report, and it shows that since 1980, the average income for the top 1% of households has grown seven times faster than that of the average family. Seven times faster. The top 400 people in this country now have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 50%. That's top, remember, if you remember anything, remember that. And the rich are getting richer and the middle class are getting poorer and they are disappearing. I don't think that is the America that we know and we love. As one struggling worker told me recently, whenever she heard that term, restoring the middle class, she always thought of it as kind of a political slogan. And then when her husband lost her job and she had to go to work and work two jobs, she started to think of it as only a prayer. I'll never forget that moment. Congress faces no bigger challenge than restoring that middle class promise and soon. And that is really what this election is about all over the country. They're gonna to try to make it about all kinds of things and run their negative attack ads, but it is really about the people of this country. What do we need to do to capture the hearts and make a difference for the people of this country? We need to raise the federal minimum wage to 10.10 an hour. That's what we need to do. We need to strengthen our innovative American businesses so we are a country that doesn't just churn money to get by. We are a country that makes stuff again, that invents things, that exports to the world. That is what we need to do to promote our better than me. I live six blocks from that bridge that collapsed in the middle of a summer day in the middle of America, right? Thirteen people died. Their cars submerged in the water. Thirteen people. An eight-lane highway. The highway that I walk over, that I drive with my daughter over and my husband every single day. As I said that day, a bridge just shouldn't fall down in the middle of America. But it did. And when that happens, we need to rebuild. And my friends here in Nevada, you know it more than anything. We need to invest in transportation and get our infrastructure up to speed. That is the only way that we need to come forward to become the true export of the economy that we need. We also need to put the dream of a quality, affordable college education back within reach. Yes. Elizabeth Warren's bill in the Senate would have had more than 250,000 people in this state finance their student loans, saving them thousands of dollars in interest fees. We got blocked by the Republicans on that bill, but after this election, and maybe even this fall, we're coming back again. Yeah. With million Americans still unemployed for more than six months, we need to pass the Senate's bipartisan unemployment compensation bill. And finally, if we're going to really move this country, and I so appreciated Harry's uh, testimony on this in front of the Judiciary Committee, we need to do something about the big money in politics. Oh, I gotta tell you, when I first started running, I didn't know anyone across the country. No one could even pronounce my name. I called people, I raised money, and they wouldn't even call me back. At some point, I got so desperate, the summer before my election, I went through my old Rolodex, and I set an all-time Senate record, this is true, I raised $17,000 from ex-boyfriends. <laughs> it is not an expanding base. <laughs> so when someone can just come in and write a $10 billion check in the Senate race or go after Kay Hagan like they did in North Carolina and have spent $15 million against her, that is wrong. And that's why we not only have to pass the Disclose Act in the United States Senate so we know who's spending the money and where they're spending it, we have to pass a constitutional amendment to tell the Supreme Court that corporations aren't people, people are people. about what we need to do. Having just been in southern Minnesota and literally seen miles and miles of wind turbines, 
We literally now had a standard we put in place with a Republican governor and a Democratic legislature that we were going to go to 30% renewable energy by 2030. We are making that standard. And by the way, we don't have nearly the setting you have here, okay? Uh, we are making it. And that's why I truly believe that our generation's version of the space race is the energy race. Yes. And you have it right here right. in the heart of the country, Nevada. This is about building the next electric car battery plant right here in Reno. And I am and not Hanoi. This is yeah. about building our own energy sources right in our country. One last thing that I care so deeply about being on the Judiciary Committee, and that is the immigration reform bill. I brought it up earlier. Let me give you a pitch that maybe you haven't heard. This country was built on immigrants, okay? Yes. Of our Fortune 500 companies, 90 of them. Right now, 90 of our Fortune 500 companies are formed by immigrants. 200 of them formed by immigrants or kids of immigrants. 30% of our Nobel laureates were actually born in other countries. 30% of our U.S. Nobel laureates were born in other countries. But right now we have a situation where the wild hockey team, we love our hockey in Minnesota, yeah, you might not be quite as into it, but our wild hockey team, they can get unlimited visas and all kinds of things to bring in players from Canada, right? And the Mayo Clinic can't bring in a nurse from another country. That is wrong. We have 12 million people in this country that love this country. And we have to pass comprehensive immigration reform. We have to pass it because we save our country money. Hmong population, biggest Somali population, big refugee population. But we finally, I finally found a way to do it. I found a 99-year-old Hispanic World War II veteran. <laughs> and I brought him to the World War II Memorial from Minnesota. He brought over to our country when he was five years old. He found out he was undocumented. At that time, you could go up to Canada and become documented, stay overnight. I don't know how they did it. They came back. He was documented, served under General MacArthur in the Pacific, and I brought him to that World War II Memorial, and he stood next to two dreamers, two 17-year-old kids that wanted to join the Air Force from high school in Minnesota who had been brought over when they were five or six years old, and they couldn't do it. That story, my friends, captured the hearts of the people in Minnesota, and we just need to get those stories getting out there. I learned this from my Slovenian grandpa. He worked 1,500 feet underground in the mines in Ely, Minnesota. Now, like Harry's dad, that's what his living. That's what he did. And also like Harry's dad, he never graduated from high school. But he and my grandma believed in that American belief. They believed that a kid of the miner could actually go to college. And they saved money in a coffee can in their basement to send my dad to college. And my dad got a two-year degree at Ely Community College up in northern Minnesota, way up near the Canadian border, and then came down to the University of Minnesota, and he got a journalism degree, and became a newspaper columnist and a sports writer, and he went on to interview everyone from Mike Ditka to Ronald Reagan to Ginger Rogers, okay? <laughs> and my mom, she grew up in Milwaukee, right during the Depression, they had no money, Swiss immigrant parents. She went on to get her teaching degree and she taught second grade until she was 70 years old. So I, I stand before you today, I stand before you today as the granddaughter of a minor and the daughter of a newspaper man and a teacher and the first woman elected to the Senate from the state of Minnesota. That's why I believe in this dream that we can do. Whenever I look for inspiration, I'll end with this. I think about my grandpa working in those mines. The sirens would go off, and, 
and my grandma would never know if it was he that died or someone else or someone else was injured. And when I went out there years after he died, when I was campaigning for Senate, I met this guy and he said that his father had worked with my grandpa in the mine. And my grandpa started working there when he was 15 years old when his parents died and he was supporting all his brothers and sisters. And so my grandpa became the foreman of this particular mine at some point. And the guy just started to cry when he talked about it. He said, all the other foremen, they would stand at the top and radio down when the miners would go to a new part of the mine. He said, but your grandpa, he'd always go with the mines and he'd go with the miners and he would always go first. He said that my grandpa was fearless. And you know what? You know a little bit about being fearless in Nevada, right? <laughs> You know what it is like to put on those hard hats, to put on your boots, to square your shoulders and get to work. And I can tell you right now, Harry Reid knows a little bit about what it's like to be fearless. So I am with this. I just ask you to take that spirit, that spirit of my grandpa, that spirit you see in Harry, the spirit you see of the great candidates gathered in this room, get to work, win this election, and let's bring home the victories in Nevada. Thank you, you guys.